Coming in at number 5 we have The Conjuring House. Upon its release in 2013, The Conjuring quickly became a fan favourite in the horror genre, with it being met with critical acclaim. The film itself follows demonologists and ghost hunters Ed and Lorraine Warren who head to a home in the country after a family reported demonic activity inside of their home. Now, At the time of the release, people knew very little about Ed and Lorraine Warren or the true events surrounding this investigation. The Perrin family moved into their haunted Rhode Island home in 1971. Not long after, Carolyn, Roger and their five daughters began to experience strange goings on. Brooms going missing, scraping noises and small piles of dirt appearing out of nowhere. All small things at first which soon developed into big things. The girls eventually began to notice spirits around the home, with the history of the home soon being revealed. Many people had drowned in the lake and of course the worst spirit of them all was Bathsheba, a woman who devoted herself to the devil and took her own life on the property, cursing anyone who would take her land. Ed and Lorraine Warren of course came to investigate the situation, with Lorraine conducting a seance to attempt to communicate with the spirits tormenting the family. During the seance, Carolyn became possessed, rising from the ground in her chair and speaking in tongues. Following the seance, the Warrens were kicked out of the home, with the family continuing to live there until 1980. Before we jump into number 4, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up, it really helps out a lot. Coming in at number 4, we have Amityville. Back in September of 1977, Jay Anson published a book called The Amityville Horror, which would later become the basis of a series of films released from 1979 onwards. The book is claimed to be based on the paranormal experience of the Lutz family, a case which of course led to many controversies and widespread attention. Now, some history before diving into the story of the Lutz family. Back in November of 1974, Ronald DeFeo Jr. shot and killed six members of his family at 112 Ocean Avenue in the suburban neighborhood in Amityville. He was ultimately convicted of second degree murder and sentenced to six life sentences, with him passing away in custody in March of this year. Now, DeFeo had reported that voices had told him to kill his family. Whether these claims were true, we don't know. Jumping forward, in December of 1975, George and Kathy Lutz and their three children moved into the same home, and after just 20 28 days they fled the house, claiming to have been terrorized by paranormal entities while living there. On the evening of March 6, 1976, the home was investigated by Ed and Lorraine Warren along with the television crew from Channel 5 New York. During the investigation, a series of pictures were taken, one of the images allegedly showing a demonic boy with glowing eyes standing at the foot of the staircase. The Warrens quite quickly suggested that the home was occupied by malevolent spirits, with the Warrens' visit to the home being depicted at the beginning beginning of The Conjuring 2. Coming in at number 3 we have The Smurl Haunting. The Smurl Haunting took place between 1974 and 1989, with Jack and Janet Smurl of West Pittston, Pennsylvania alleging that a demon was inhabiting their home. The claims gained a lot of attention as you would expect, with demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren once again stepping in to solve the case. Now the family moved into their home on Chase Street, with them claiming that they were being disturbed by a demon that caused loud noises and bad odours, with one report stating that the dog was randomly thrown across a room. In 1986, Ed and Lorraine Warren arrived at the home, and according to Ed, the demon that was inhabiting the home was incredibly powerful, with it shaking mirrors and furniture after they tried to get it to leave by playing religious music and praying. Ed even claimed that he felt a significant drop in temperature and saw a dark mass inside of the home. The demon also supposedly left a message on a mirror that read, Get Out. Ed and Lorraine Warren went on to state that their experience at the small residence was unlike anything they had investigated at the time. Coming in at number 2 we have The Snedeker House. Now many of you will be familiar with The Snedeker House haunting thanks to the movie The Haunting in Connecticut. The Haunting in Connecticut movie was released in 2009 and directed by Peter Cornwell, and supposedly follows the alleged haunting of Carmen Snedeker and her family. Now the movie has a ton of controversy surrounding it, with the author of the book the movie was based on even distancing himself from the accuracy of the events depicted in the book. Now the film itself specifically focuses on the fictional Campbells as they move into the new home. Home, which was formerly a mortuary to mitigate the strains of travel on Matt, her cancer stricken son. However, not long after moving into the new home, the family becomes haunted by violent and supernatural forces. Now, the true story is a little, well, a lot different. In 1986, Carmen and Alan Snedeker moved into a new home with their daughter and three sons. While exploring the home, they discovered tools used by morticians, very creepy indeed, with it being discovered to be a form of funeral parlor, with the eldest son beginning to see ghosts and be haunted by terrifying visions. The family eventually turned to demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren, who proclaimed that the home was infested with demons. Now, this is supposedly all very much true, however, many have had their doubts over the years.
years, including Snedeker's landlord who found the entire story ridiculous, even noting that prior to the family moving in there had been no complaints or unusual activity inside of the home. On top of that, the Snedeker stayed for a total of two years before finally deciding to leave. And finally coming in at number 1 we've got Enfield Poltergeist. Taking the Warrens across the ocean, the Enfield Poltergeist has become a popular paranormal case, with it also being the focal point for The Conjuring 2. The Conjuring 2 was released in 2016 and followed Ed and Lorraine as they travelled to Enfield in the United Kingdom to assist the Hodgson family, who were said to be experiencing paranormal activity inside of their home in 1977, with the daughter Janet even becoming possessed by a former resident. Now, this movie is very much based on a true story, however, when a paranormal experience is dubbed real, people tend to try and find holes in the story, with many doubting the accounts of the family. Like I said, the Enfield Poltergeist was a claim of supernatural activity between the years of 1977 to 1979, with it specifically involving two sisters, Margaret and Janet. In August of 1977, single parent Peggy Hodgson claimed she had witnessed furniture moving and heard knocking sounds around her home. A police officer arrived on scene and he himself reported seeing a chair wobble and slide across the floor without any rhyme or reason. Following this, disembodied voices were heard, loud noises echoed around the home and the children even began levitating. More than 30 people reported seeing furniture move and heard voices around the home. Ed and Lorraine Warren were of course called in to assess the situation, with them visiting the home in 1978 and were convinced that the events had a supernatural explanation. Coming in at number 5 we have the White Lady of Easton. Located in Easton, Connecticut, Union Cemetery is a site that dates back to the 1700s. And according to ghost hunters and paranormal investigators, it is one of the most haunted cemeteries in all of the United States. Now, according to local legend, a ghost haunts Union Cemetery, who has been dubbed the White Lady. She's also said to haunt Stepney Cemetery in Monroe as well. She is described as wearing a white nightgown or a wedding dress esque outfit, with demonologist Ed Warren once claiming to have physical evidence to support these claims. Now, claims of paranormal occurrences at the cemetery had been occurring for decades prior to Ed and Lorraine Warren investigating the location. Ed Warren and several Eastern police officers visited the site, which is when Ed supposedly caught the apparition on camera. Ed claimed that several ghost lights came together to form the shape of a woman who had no facial features, but had dark hair and was wearing a white dress. Terrifying. Now, there isn't a whole lot of information about the ghost or the cemetery, however, Ed and Lorraine Warren wrote a book about the location entitled Graveyard. Maybe check it out. You do you. Before we jump into number four, be sure to give this video a big thumbs up. It really helps out a lot. Coming in at number four, we have the South End Werewolf. Apparently, a lot of demonic activity occurs in Essex, with this being one of two to appear on our list. Born and raised in South End in Essex in the United Kingdom, Bill Ramsey began to experience trouble at the young age of nine years old. He was outside one day when he began to feel a little strange. An icy blast swept over him, and a foul stench appeared, causing him to almost vomit. Anger began to take hold, and the young Young boy uprooted a fence post, swinging it around like a club with the fence still attached. It was stated that not even his parents were able to remove the post with their hands. Bill Ramsey then placed the wire meshing of the fence into his mouth and began to chew on it, terrifying his parents in the process, who supposedly ran into their home for safety. Following the incident, things settled, with nothing occurring for 15 years. Bill Ramsey grew up, got married, and became a father of three. However, during this time, he was plagued by nightmares, waking up in a cold sweat and feeling dread and unease. Once again, another 15 years passed with no repeat occurrences of what happened when he was a young boy. That was until 1983 when Bill was out at a pub with a few of his friends. After having a few drinks, he began to feel that same chill he experienced when he was young. He went to the bathroom, looked in the mirror, and looking back at him was a werewolf. He hopped in a car with a few friends, heading home. However, he began to growl with his hands twisting into claws, and proceeded to try to bite his friend's leg. After a handful of incidents that would follow this one, Bill was taken to a psychiatric hospital, with doctors being unable to explain his condition. Bill ultimately travelled to the States to meet Ed and Lorraine Warren, where a priest performed an exorcism on Bill, which which supposedly cured him, but not before he partially transformed into a werewolf in front of witnesses. Coming in at number three, we have the Borley Church Haunting. The Borley Rectory was a home located in Essex, England, that gained widespread attention after being dubbed the most haunted home in England, with it being described as such by Harry Price, a psychic researcher. According to reports, the rectory itself has been haunted since it was built, with sudden reports being filed in 1929 after the Daily Mirror published an article detailing the account 
of a visit by paranormal researcher Harry Price. Now, the first major paranormal event occurred on July 28, 1900, after four daughters of the rector, Henry Dawson Ellis Bull, reported seeing the ghost of a nun not far from their house. However, when they tried to approach, the ghost disappeared. Other people throughout the years complained of similar sightings, including phantom coaches driven by headless horsemen. Freaky. However, let's take a look at the church. The hauntings date back even prior to these occurrences, with folklore claiming that the first haunting occurred in the 14th century following the execution of a nun who had an affair with a monk. The Warrens ended up travelling to Essex to investigate the claims of paranormal activity at the rectory, with people reporting ghostly chanting and organ music, along with sightings of the executed nun and of a ghostly monk. Prior to his death, Ed Warren even claimed to have captured a picture of the ghost monk, showing him leafing through a book inside of the church. Borley Church ultimately served as the inspiration for the movie The Nun, which sadly was a major letdown. Also, mostly fiction? Coming in at number two, we have the Lindley Street Haunting. Lorraine and I were in that house for almost three days and nights. We watched as furniture moved around, smashed, broke. People came in and witnessed this, firemen, priests. The home located at 966 Lindley Street in Bridgeport, Connecticut is a truly fascinating story, being dubbed the most haunted house in America, with the Warrens referring to it as, I quote, the most important poltergeist case of the last 100 years. The home belonged to Gerald and Laura Goodwin, who lived there along with their adopted daughter, Marsha. According to reports, several people claimed to see furniture moving on its own accord and a crucifix flying off the wall. For those who know the case, you'll know that one of the key elements of the story is the report that the fact family cat could speak, with claims surfacing that Sam the cat was caught singing Christmas carols in the family's basement. Now at some point in time, Marsha confessed that the entire thing was a hoax and that she was responsible for the events that occurred. However, the Warrens weren't having any of it, with Ed and Lorraine believing no child was capable of being behind the incidents they witnessed firsthand. Whether you believe it or not, the case is certainly an interesting one that has divided many. I mean, when the Warrens are involved, you know there is going to be some criticism. Also, how do you explain a talking cat? Like if its mouth's opening, it's talking. You know? And finally, coming in at number one, we have Satan's Harvest. Now, many will be familiar with the name Maurice Theriot, or more commonly referred to as Frenchie, thanks to the movie The Nun, with the character appearing throughout. However, I should preface this point by saying that everything that happened in The Nun with Frenchie is in fact fictional, but the character is very much based on a real person. Frenchie was the son of French Canadian farmers in Maine and grew up in a fairly toxic and abusive household, with his father exhibiting violent tendencies towards him. At the age at the age of 51, Frenchie was living in Massachusetts with his wife Nancy and their children. To friends, he was a gentle man and extremely kind to anyone he met. However, behind closed doors housed something truly evil. He explained that his behavior was the result of being possessed by a demon, which pushed him towards violence. Blood would flow from his eyes and religious markings began to appear on his body. A local parish priest called in the help of Ed and Lorraine Warren, because of course, apparently everyone knows Ed and Lorraine. During their investigation, they saw Frenchie bleed from his eyes and saw symbols appear on his body. He also exhibited superhuman strength, which they believe was the result of demonic possession. They specifically believed that Frenchie had fallen into the grip of Satan himself. Three exorcisms were performed on Frenchie, the latter of which proved to be something truly terrifying. Frenchie's face began to change, his skin burned and blistered, and on his forehead a deep wound appeared, and his eyes began to look like snake eyes. However, the exorcism ultimately proved to be a success, with him having no incidents following. Coming in at number five, we've got the Smurl Haunting. Technically, there already is a movie about the Smurl Haunting, titled The Haunted, and released as a made-for-TV movie back in 1991, folks with cable television were treated to a horrifying vision of demonic possession in Pennsylvania. However, we live in the golden age of streaming, with brand new top-notch movies and shows being released almost daily. So with the advances in filmmaking technology and maybe some assistance from the research team at Bloomhouse, I think this tale could be brought back to life in incredible fashion. Based on what's happened with the mainline Conjuring series lately, it would be interesting interesting to see a return to a strictly haunted house format, but the story here is rich enough to make it work. Here's the real life story of the Smurls. Hopefully you'll see how it works as a movie. In the mid 70s, Janet and Jack Smurl were forced out of their home due to flood damage. They packed up their stuff, got their kids and parents in a car, and moved down to West Pittston. For a while, they focused their energy on fixing the place up. Some painting needed to be done, and old appliances needed to be replaced. Other than that though, all seemed well. 
This was short lived however. Soon weird things started happening. Tools would disappear without a trace or end up in places far away from where they should be. Stains would seep through brand new coats of paint no matter how thick it was laid on. Kitchen appliances would catch fire even if they weren't plugged in at the time. And of course, terrible smells permeated throughout but would disappear quickly once noticed. Pretty standard haunted stuff if you ask me. But that was just the beginning as even more noticeable ghastly behavior began. The kids heard disembodied voices that pretended to be their siblings and Janet insisted that she heard her mother-in-law calling out to her. Dark shapes would float around the house and one night one seemed to crawl into bed with the Smurls. Needless to say they were pretty freaked out. Things hit a fever pitch when the family dog was thrown up against the wall and Janet was picked up and dangled three feet in the air. At that point it was time to bring in some help. The Warrens arrived and soon found out that there were three human spirits in the house accompanied by a malevolent demon. Two of the spirits were harmless and the third one was potentially violent, but the demon was the real problem. It made the other spirits do awful things and intensified the haunting plenty. You can see how this would make for an excellent horror movie, right? We meet the Smurls as they're moving in. Things are hunky dory. However, the kids notice some strange stuff at night and mom and dad are wondering why their renovations aren't holding up. Then something changes and it is full on haunt mode. Ed and Lorraine show up and the mystery begins to unravel. Tie it in with the other Conjuring flicks and you've got yourself a summer horror blockbuster. Blumhouse, call me. Coming in at number 4 we've got Lindley Street. Here we have another famous haunted house which would perfectly align with the rest of the series had they not switched it up for The Devil Made Me Do It. I'm sure a return to form would go over just fine though. Moving on from my goofy format based nitpicking, here's a good story. Haunted houses tend to get folks interested in anything so that's a good start. Also happening in the mid 70s at the time, this was a well publicized poltergeist. Connecticut is famous for all sorts of haunted and damned locations but Lindley Street is probably one of the most famous. Gerard and Laura Good Goodwin, homeowners and good Samaritans reported an array of otherworldly attacks in their little bungalow. Windows were broken, furniture was scattered, a cat inexplicably spoke in English and more. The longer this went on, the more folks became interested. For a while, all sorts of folks that weren't the Goodwins saw these paranormal occurrences too. That's what made this such a high profile haunting. All sorts of reputable and reliable community members claiming to see insane, seemingly impossible things happening in their peaceful neighborhood. News teams, nosy neighbors, firefighters, police squads, priests and of course the Warrens were called in to see what they could do. And then, just like the neighbors, the policemen and firefighters saw the paranormal experiences happening. So there are a few ways we could approach this tale of terror in a cinematic fashion. There's the obvious way which is fitting the events into the Conjuring universe and having all sorts of new characters introduced that could have witnessed the haunting. Classic can't miss stuff right there. However, the guy in me who took a bunch of film courses at university makes me want to look at this a little differently. You know, I want to hear all sorts of different perspectives, a bit of he said, she she said, maybe investigate what each individual saw and see if there is an ultimate answer. If I'm being too vague, I'll come right out and say it. Let's make a haunted house Rashomon. Like have the Warrens or some surrogate demonologists come in at the very beginning and ask folks what's happening. Then you get accounts from each invested party and every tale is different in some way or another. And then as is the case with most real life haunted houses, we don't really come away with a concrete answer. Just the tales of those who experienced it themselves and the tricky job of putting the pieces together ourselves. Think about it. Coming in at number 3 we've got the Donovan family. Ghosts and romance, ain't nothing better right? Plus when was the last time they made a specter filled love story for the big screen? We got warm bodies a while ago but since then we've really seen nothing new. Maybe a few indie movies where the monsters are surprisingly alluring and I suppose the shape of water counts for something but all of those have physical monsters to smush. Lust is a hell of a drug don't you know. So what if we took the story of a girl summoning a ghost via Ouija board and then falling in love with it? Well that's what happened with the Donovan family haunting. Their daughter brought a demon into the house, dated it for a bit and then realized that it was just using her to sap at the life force of everyone around. Yikes. You've heard of people being used for their bodies or their money but their life energy? That's gotta sting a little bit. It would be a fun descent into madness with audiences realizing halfway through that this otherworldly suitor does not have the protagonist's best interests at heart. Definitely worth a rewatch to see what you missed the first time too. Coming in at number 2 we've got the South End Werewolf. 
Now, we've talked about returning to haunted houses a couple times today with varying results, but what about adding a werewolf story to the Conjuring universe? Now, that's what I'm talking about. The Warrens apparently had a run in with some sort of lichen adjacent during one of their exorcisms. It wasn't a traditional werewolf. Full moons and silver bullets were more or less left out of the equation. But in the case of Bill Ramsey, a hellish transformation apparently did take place. As a kid, Ramsey had a few bestial outbursts, but seemed to chill out as he got a little older. However, out of the blue, an adult Ramsey started acting absolutely feral once more. After a brief stint in a mental hospital, Ramsey linked up with the Warrens and made his way to the States, where a priest was waiting to perform an exorcism. During this ritual, witnesses claimed to have seen him turn partially into some sort of man beast. Now, I'd say if you're gonna make a movie about this, you're gonna need to have a full transformation a couple times, you know, to get that American Werewolf in London vibe. Hell, even the backstory should be him actually contorting into a fanged beast and running Ramsey. Rampant. It won't be all true, but it will make for some excellent popcorn moments. And finally, at number one, we've got West Point. Unsurprisingly, there are a lot of haunted military academies out there. One of the most famous, and therefore most movie worthy, is the West Point Academy in New York. For years, cadets, recruits, superintendents, librarians, and more reported weird goings on. Ghost soldiers would appear before frightened students, and items frequently got tossed around. All sorts of colorful, undead characters tend to show up here as well. There's the pusher, a chilling apparition that pushes and holds people down in their sleep, rendering them immobile. Then there's the ghost cook Molly, who is a little disgruntled and likes to rumple bedsheets and smash wine bottles. One of the most famous ghosts here is a soldier turned murderer known as Greer. The Warrens were called in during the 70s to see what they could do about it all and spoke with and did impressions of some of these figures. Any or all of these ghosts would make for a really fun flick filled with poltergeist style scares and ghosts with real personality. Now, I'm sure that in due time we'll see all these stories adapted. The Conjuring universe is an insane moneymaker, and the Warren stories are too good to pass up. Starting off this countdown, we have the Buddhist exorcism. <laughs> In the early 2000s, the Warrens took a trip to Japan to check out these haunted tunnels that a number of people have died in. But while they were there, they were contacted to perform an exorcism on a woman named Teresa. This footage is very creepy. Not only is it actual footage of someone that is possessed, but you can also hear the demon in her voice reaching out to talk to Lorraine. In this clip, I'm about to show you Lorraine is trying to reach out to Teresa and get her to fight back against the demon possessing her. Oh, Teresa, you hear me. You understand me. Teresa, leave. Leave, Teresa. You, leave, dear. Leave. I'm here to help you. I'm here to help you, Teresa. Things take a turn when Teresa starts speaking in English to Lorraine. I should note that Teresa didn't know English, so clearly it was the demon speaking. You see your mother? Go with your mother, Teresa. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. Go with your mother. Do you see your mother? Do you see your mother? Do you see your mother? Do Towards the end of the exorcism, Teresa starts lashing out towards Lorraine and others. We see her crawling around and growling like a demon and talking all raspy. I guess the demon was really fighting back because poor Teresa was going through a lot at this point. The footage ends with Lorraine once again telling Teresa to fight back against the demon. Hopefully they managed to complete this exorcism successfully. Now I tried to google this case but unfortunately there wasn't much information out there on it. So we may never know. In fact it was after this trip in Japan where Ed got really sick and his health started to decline. Maybe this demon had something to do with it. 
Moving on to number four, we have Scotland's Underground City. And if you guys are liking this video so far, then why don't you hit that like button? And today, there still are. They're are still people. haunted. Yes. yes. There are people like you that see them. In fact, I've never seen them, but there are people that see these ghosts from the boat. Mary King's been seen up here, and she's been seen down at the bottom. In 1996, Ed and Lorraine Warren visited Edinburgh in Scotland to investigate an underground city. The city was said to be haunted. In the video, you see an older tour guide telling them about the history of this underground city, how there used to be underground shops and stuff like that down there. At one point, he talked about getting bad vibes from being down there, and apparently Lorraine was sensing that as well. That's when you get the funny feeling. I got funny feeling, all right. However, very bad one by one, they all died off until there was nobody left. It gets worse when he talks about how everyone died down there and there were just piles of bodies because there was no one left to get rid of them. Which is probably why the place is haunted. I mean, a number of people died there and didn't have a proper burial. Well, at one point in the video, Lorraine claims she hears a ghost walking by. Can't be. No. What are you hearing? Um, like the sound of, of, of people, of more than one person together walking by and, you know, like heavy clothing rubbing against each other, that okay. type of thing, I could hear. I'm going home. <laughs> and I could hear that right. and I wondered, I, I, you, you, you looked, Frank, so I thought you heard the same no, thing. No, I didn't hear it. Yeah. That's not all. She started to pick up on another vibe. It feels like somebody is like squeezing your insides all together, actually squeezing the life right out of you. I have no clue how she wasn't scared to death experiencing all of that. Honestly, she was brave. It blows my mind. In our third spot today, we have the family in Connecticut. And no, this isn't the same as the family from the haunting in Connecticut case. Just apparently, Connecticut has a lot of hauntings. So basically, Ed and Lorraine Warren went to Connecticut to help a family whose home was being haunted by a spirit. What I'm about to show you is real footage from this case. Basically, it starts with Ed and Lorraine sitting at a table praying with the family. Then, Ed tries to make contact with whatever is haunting their house. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Come. One knock for yes, two for no. Are you a man? Are you a boy? One knock for yes, two for no. Yes. Okay. Using that one knock for yes, two knocks for no method, Ed was able to find out more about this ghost. Most here is it? Is it? So the ghost was haunting their home and causing a scene because it didn't like the family's mother. But that's not the only ghostly thing that they managed to capture on camera. Later on, Ed asked the ghost to give them a sign and then the kitchen chair moves on its own. Give me some sign. Is that you moving something? Give me some sign that you're here. I command you to reveal your identity. No thank you. If that happened at my house, I would be out of there so fast. In our second spot, we have Maurice Theriel. If you've seen the movie The Nun, then you already know about a man named Maurice or Frenchie. This guy was a hardworking farmer that ended up getting diabolically possessed. This occurred in 1985. Sometimes blood would randomly pour out of his body, like from his nose, eyes, and mouth. And he didn't know what was causing it. He also developed super strength and could randomly understand and speak Latin. At first he went to the police for help, then a priest, and then finally Ed and Lorraine Warren agreed to help him. Now he apparently went through a number of exorcisms. The footage I'm going to share with you is from his last exorcism. So the footage starts off with Ed asking Frenchie to lift up his shirt. Apparently, random crosses would show up engraved in his skin. Up the front. Feet up in the shoulder? Yeah. Move, yeah, you're in the way, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It literally looks like somebody took something sharp and carved crosses into him and then it scarred up. But those would appear all over his body, randomly appearing and disappearing. During this exorcism, a number of scary things happened. 
For starters, we see him drooling from his mouth, but as soon as the drool hits his shirt, it turns to blood. Then, at one point, we see Frenchie hunched over in pain. This is apparently because spirits enter people through their solar plexus. And then, at another point, we see Frenchie become incredibly still and his face changes completely. He doesn't look like himself. His eyes look so glossy. And lastly, we see a cut randomly appear on his forehead and start to bleed on its own, out of nowhere. That is absolutely horrifying. And in our number one spot, we have the unseen tapes. YouTuber Haley Reese got the chance to actually meet up with Tony Spira, the husband of Judy Warren. He provided her with insight into the Warren cases and actually showed her some unseen exorcism footage. She then uploaded this onto YouTube. In this video, we see Tony and Lorraine Warren performing an exorcism on a man named Roberto. Take a look at it. This is the power of Jesus Christ. Okay. You hear me? Jesus Christ has all the power. You have none. What is your name? So in the video, as you just saw, they're trying to find out this demon's name to then help expel it. And guys, you're not gonna believe what demon was inside of him. Here, continue watching. What is your name? Jesus Christ commands you to answer that question. What is your what name? What is your name? Beelzebub? Is that what you're saying? Beelzebub? This dude was possessed by Beelzebub! When I heard that, I literally got shivers down my spine. Like, holy! So for those of you that don't know, in Christian texts, the name Beelzebub is often associated with the devil himself. They would alternate between using this name and Satan. He is considered one of the seven princes of hell, and he is associated with the sin of gluttony. In other texts, he's described as the lieutenant of hell. He's second in power to Satan. It's crazy, but hold on. He wasn't just possessed by Beelzebub, but by other entities as well. What other entities inside you? God is commanding you. In the name of Jesus Christ, and all the saints, and all the martyrs, and all the angels command you to answer that question. What is it? I genuinely don't know how they stayed so calm as this dude list all the demons possessing him. The video went on and they found at least four demons were inside of him. They then asked the demons why they were possessing Roberto, and they replied with power. Why are you in Roberto? Why are you there with Roberto? Jesus Christ doesn't like semonic spirits within a human spirit. Jesus Christ hates demonic spirits to be within a human being. You know that? You hate Jesus, huh? I don't know about you, but that creeped me out. It is terrifying.